Jackie can't be with us tonight, and but I do want to, her to speak in, in her own words about the origins of the play and how she came to write that. So we have a little bit of an interview where she's um, speaking with Eric N, who was the chair of the uh, playwriting MFA program at Brown University. And that's where Jackie uh, got her MFA under Eric and uh, he arranged this interview with her. This is from 2012 as the play was really just beginning to be produced. So uh, Jake, if you have that, let's take a look at, at that. It's just about five or six minutes. First is just what, what are the, could you tell us sort of the natural history of this play? Where did it begin for you and how did it come into being? Um, I guess uh, the like the inauspicious <laughs> version is um, I I was I was researching a different play um, about an actor who is in a lot of Werner Herzog movies, um, and he is German, but like the son of a, a black American GI and a German woman, um, and he plays a, like a black American GI in all of these movies, and so I thought it would be. An interesting topic for play. I think it still might be. Um, <laughs> I've not written it, but it, um, I was trying to work on it, and I just—I I think that I—I I just Google Black people Germany to get more information. <laughs> 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 and, like I think that like like if not the first page of search, but like the like at the end of it was a genocide that I'd never heard of, and had and, and um, had no yeah had never heard of at all, and so I became really fixated on that, and I happened to be. Um, or I was living in Chicago with my now husband, um, and not uh, not had not doing anything. So I went. I got to go to the University of Chicago Library a lot and did a bunch of research um, on the genocide. Um, but that doesn't actually totally say where this play came from. But I um, I then so I, I started doing research about probably like six years ago, and then actually um, started writing it. Um, as my thesis for you at Brown, and started it, um, in, or started writing it over the summer, but then really started it um, during the Mahavimu class. So, yeah. Actually, I didn't know that. No, I, I thought didn't. it started in this, in this class about photographic representation. Or also that yeah. class. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just because I'm here, somebody else. <laughs> oh, I started it a quick check of the guy that started quick checking. Exactly. That's a good example. Sorry. Um, uh, 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 Good. So a long, a long gestation process and, and um, a bit of a bit of serendipity. And it seems like this structurally the play that works way the play works that way too. That you you enter one space and you you keep turning corners and finding darker and darker rooms inside this house. So the the play mirrors a kind of cognitive process. And maybe that's really the drama of the play is how we how we stumble upon and then stumble into genocide or these unspeakable conditions. Um, uh, this play, you, you told me earlier that the play had changed some. It, it felt different. It felt very different, not only because of your uh, wonderful cast, uh, it, it, uh, you know, a superbly kinetic uh, and apt sense of direction, I think. Not only the production felt different, but the script also felt different. And I wonder if it actually was different and how it changed and why it changed. Yeah, it, 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 it changed a lot. Um, the because the, the first the very first draft of it um, was sort of like at the end of fall semester and then we had workshop productions as part of our MFA program in the spring semester um, and the, that 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 draft was even more different where um, I think that it was um, I'm just gonna say bad things about it and you don't have to agree but I thought it was like really earnest. Um, and it had shadow puppets, and it was like really different. And um, Ernest do shadow puppets like that? <laughs> no, no, but it, it, was, it was just sort of like it was. It, it, um, um, the only text of that that survives are, are, are some like a lot of the, or not all of them, but some of the letters were like that was like sort of the way that the whole play was, and um, and it just didn't feel actually like me writing it, and um, I think that part of that was because I was. Um, uh, not, I felt unable to 
to authentically talk to this thing that I was trying to talk to. And so I felt like I was like trying to sound great while talking about it, but then that what could be offensive or was offensive, I think, in a way. And so um, I sort of took a step back and started um, a brand to introduce um, this idea of, of actors sort of failing to make the same play that I failed to make. And, um, and so that's, that was something that I just did then. But, um, working on it in Chicago with the director, Eric Ting, um, I, I, I spent a lot more time defining these two worlds. And I think at, at Brown, it was sort of one continuous space and time. And then realizing that there was an opportunity to um, actually have a rehearsal in the play. Um, and as a central idea of comparing, of, of, of trauma and of reenacting trauma. And um, even if it's not um, finalized, it still is dramatic. Or even if it's not. Um, the biggest trauma that there's ever been is still a dream. So um, that's so defining the world and this is something that's right here than it was before. Um, th 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 I, I have a, a final question. But okay, great. Yeah, so that's interesting. It did. It went through, I think, several permutations. The play, and uh, I've also read, uh, and I remember talking with her about this when she came to see an, a production of another play of hers that we did called Really. And she said that, um, yeah, the first attempt at the play was this attempt to tell the history of this genocide in a linear fashion, and it just was really. Um, it just never went where she was hoping to take it. And of course, um, since then, and since we produced Proud to Present, you know, she's gone on to write not only really, uh, she did a play called Social Creatures, which is a, known as her zombie play. And um, then she wrote uh, Fairview, which won the Pulitzer Prize last year uh and she's written another play called mary's sequel um and so she's really been busy and uh making waves and this was a uh a great production for me to work on and be around and to watch you all put it together i was really uh enamored of everyone's work especially uh Millicent, because it is um, so, uh, it's very kinetic and uh, physically demanding. But so my first question for everybody is, did you have an awareness of this play before you were approached about working on it? Or was the approach about being a part of it the first time you became aware of it? And did you have any awareness of this uh, genocide of the Herrero people uh, by the Germans. Um, and also, you know, that serves as the focal point of the play, of the play that the actors are creating, but also it, it's used as, um, it really, uh, the parallels of that systematic uh, genocide and things that we see happening in our own society kind of jump out at us as we watch it but so my first question is yeah did you have an awareness of the play before you were involved in it and um were you aware of the herrero genocide so let's start with first person that i see is shannon there um I, the first time I heard of the play was when you all approached me um, with it, and I had never heard of the Herrero genocide. Okay, Dylan. So, um, yeah, I, I, I certainly hadn't heard of this event in history, and I, I think I first found the play 
probably through Jackie's agent, who we've worked with at Underland before, um, um, Ancha Ogle, who I don't think works as an agent anymore, unfortunately. She was a real champion of a lot of exciting experimental work. Uh, but I think this play was among a series of plays that uh, I think she pitched or presented to Underman as things that we might be interested in. Um, and that was how I encountered it. Millicent? Yeah, no, I had never heard of uh, this particular work or the genocide. Um, I remember the first reading at the Undermain and uh, just sitting there listening to different things unfold in the space um, just from the reading. And I grew very interested in learning more about the genocide from that first reading. Evoma? No, I also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to agree. I did not, had not heard of the play, but curiously when I told my little brother was going to Sam Houston State in the theater department at that time, and he was familiar with it because the, the program there was putting it on. Um, so I, I, at that time thought, oh, maybe this is, you know, more white, being more widely played than I think it is. Um, but yeah, I had never heard of the genocide um, before then, and I don't hear much about it um, now, really. Brian? I will say I did not know of the work before uh, you all approached me, but oddly enough, one of my coworkers told me her lineage is Herrero. Mm -hmm. And I said, how do you even know that word? Because it must be true that you are. So, and she's, yeah, she totally went nuts when I told her about this. She, she just, bleh, all these things. But I didn't know anything before of the genocide at all. I heard very small rumblings about it, you know, kind of just doing my own history, uh, but, but not to this extent. Right, that's really interesting. Apparently it was like the first, <laughs> the first genocide of the 20th century, which I guess had many other genocides, but um, so let's see, my next question, and I would like uh, to hear more from Millicent about the approach that you took to uh, putting the play together with Dylan. And also the play really requires a real um, physicality for all the actors. And not only that, but uh, stamina, because the play, as it heats up, it's it's almost like you know as much physical activity as playing basketball it seems to me it's like <laughs> constantly in motion and they're also you know uh one interesting thing to me was that jackie had written into the play um these african rhythm structures which we all decided really needed to come from the cast so in addition to them, you know, bringing the physical life of the play, they also were providing that rhythm uh, structure to it. So I was just curious about your approach and and coordinating all of that. Sure. Um, so I mentioned the reading. Um, I usually, it's funny, I know when I'm in the pocket of something great, when I hear it for a first time and the, the room kind of disappears around me. When I can just get lost in the words on the page, then I know I'm in the pocket of something that's great. Because then at that point, I am this creator in union with some other creative energy around me. And I know that I'm going to be guided towards something larger than myself. So that happened in that room. <laughs> <laughs> during that first reading. Um, and I remember, you know, my first meeting with Dylan, he was just so open. He was a, an open vessel, right? So I came in with some ideas and it was a lot of just um, bouncing ideas between each other back and forth. Um, I am a, a student of West African dance, South African dance, so the the rhythms that were kind of pointed out in the stage direction, they weren't intimidating because I, I love South Africa and I love Southern African rhythms. Um, so I think that if I remember correctly, it was a nine and a seven that we played with. Um, those rhythms, 
I think we pulled from some Mozambican rhythms that I had played with in another project um, that I helped choreograph with the Urban Bushwoman. Because at the time, uh, that you know that was like 2002, 2003. We were we were touring with the National Song and Dance Company in Mozambique, and so within that rehearsal process, we were playing with a lot of rhythms that were nines and sevens and fives outside of a Western form. So when it came, you know, time for us to work on this particular work, I kind of pulled those rhythms out of my back pocket and reimagined them to support the storytelling. Um, I also grew up stepping and I played basketball my entire life <laughs> outside of dance. So, you know, for me, it was about finding those common, uh, the commonalities between uh, physical language and physical storytelling, you know, the exhaustion that you feel when you're running laps or running, I think historically they were called suicides. I'm not sure what basketball players call them now when you're running uh, lines on the court. Um, the exhaustion you feel when you're constantly being met with uh, microaggressions, that same exhaustion that you feel from running a race all day or running those exercises all day, that's how it, it feels when you're dealing with microaggressions, especially in a creative process. So I try to tap into like my own emotional place as far as how I would feel as those characters. And then I tapped into my historical um, lineage as you know a, a basketball player as a, a student of, of African dance as a student of Caribbean dance I grew up in the south I grew up in Louisiana so I'm, I'm very familiar with a work song very familiar with those rhythms that came out of um, you know those the dances and the rhythms that that came out of levy calls and fill hollers and people working on the railroad so we played you know we played a lot with the rhythms that I was familiar with just based on my own upbringing and my travels to Africa and again Dylan was so open so when I would pitch some of these ideas you know it, it was great he was a collaborator right so we posed questions to each other and then we landed on something great and then the cast at first if i remember it was a little intimidating at first those rhythms do you guys remember that <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yep. and try you know i had them dancing with sticks and then we were doing some stepping from south africa some gumbo movement from south africa and uh, they were great. They were so committed to embodying the storytelling given the information that I gave them, you know? So I think that's how we were able to land. And we believed in the story, right? So I can give you dance steps all day and I can give you stage direction all day, but it's up to you as the vessel to like, to go deep within yourself to figure out how to tell that story with your physical language, your physical body. How do you form the marriage between what's on the page and what your body is naturally suggesting that you do in the moment? So we worked a lot in that way and in that regard. Oh, that's great. Fascinating, actually. Yeah, and it was really amazing to watch you all put it together. I would often feel kind of guilty because you were all physicalizing so much and I was just kind of observing uh, every night, but... Uh, <laughs> It was fascinating. And Dylan, um, anything you'd like to add to what Millicent is saying? Like, did you, did it take you a while to figure out um, an approach for it or? I think the play as written, you know, it was always such an interesting mirror on our own collaboration, right? Because it's the show with these people who are trying to be together to make something, trying to navigate their own relationship to material that in some ways is very far away from them, but in other ways deeply personal to them. Um, and, you know, every day in rehearsal and in collaboration, it felt like I, we were touching on issues that are happening in the show for the characters. And um, I think that things that we had the leg up on is I think we had a lot more experience than the characters do in the show. Um, and I think a lot of goodwill. Um, and I think that's sort of how we flew by. I think just one other thing about the movement, I think, and I remember when I 
think we were first talking about doing this show at Undermain. Um, I think it was you, Bruce, you're like, there's no way we could do the show if we can't get Mills and Johnny to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of like item number one in putting the show on. But I think so much of the play is about, um, is about personal presence in relationship with other people, right? And the characters in the show, I think, are struggling to be with each other and struggling to be their sort of full selves, whatever that means in rehearsal. And I think the place to always start is within the body, right? And I think the fact that we as a company were able to start with so much physical practice, I think, at least from my perspective, and I'm not doing the, the stepping and pounding that y'all were doing on the, on the floor, but I feel like that got us to a level of the real and the level of the personal that I think we always needed as like a foundation to be together as we move through this. Um, it was just such a touch point, I think, to get us through all the show. Yeah, yeah you know, and um, so this is a good place to talk about. Um, Jackie is a wonderful uh, comedic writer, which sometimes is overshadowed by the uh, sex, uh, the uh, social complexities of where her plays go, but she has this really amazing ability to construct humor and humorous situations. And she certainly does that with this uh, idea of a group of actors having to come up with a, a play that they're gonna develop out of improvisations about the Herrero genocide. And you don't think, yeah, that doesn't sound like, wow, that doesn't sound like it's gonna be funny. But the way that she does it, um, it's amazing. Cause as I watched the uh, video again, um, I had forgotten how funny the play is until she, everything heats up and it gets very intense and we leave that behind, but it's, that kind of makes it more powerful because she's able to catch us off guard. Um, but part of the humor comes from this clash of worldviews, like let's say the, the white actors, um, although you get the sense, and especially the way you all played them, that they were, you know, um, good, nice, liberal people, but what they want to bring to the play is always this, the European viewpoint. Um, and when it comes up against um, the other actors, the black actors, I mean, one of, uh, Chris had a line that, you know, always kind of brought the house down because, you know, some of the white actors are exploring, they have these letters from the German soldiers and they keep exploring that and saying, well, what was their romantic relationship with their sweetheart? And finally, Chris says, are we gonna sit here and watch white people fall in love all day? I mean, you know, and that's so indicative of um, a lot of times, uh, let's say in Hollywood for decades until almost the last couple of years, the way they try to explore stories is always from that white perspective. It's always been like, you know, like the favorite thing was like, oh, the white savior idea. And so it's here are the male patriarchal point of view, a hero's journey. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, and here's this, uh, this group of actors, and they're all, they seem to all be friends and gung-ho about, we're going to create this thing. And then when the, obviously, when it becomes obvious that the worldviews are not aligning here, and you have the black actor saying, wait, this is a story about a genocide of the Herrero people. We need to use the black perspective, you know, of this situation. And just as they start to inhabit the different sides of that is when the conflict really starts to heat up and it starts to bring in their own uh, awareness or lack of awareness uh, into it. So 
I just wonder if that dynamic for some of you, if that ever became a little intense or um, I know that I remember Jake would often say that it was really hard for him to, uh, to go through, especially the latter part of the play. He kind of became a heavy in it and, you know, uh, it was difficult for him, but I just wonder if any of those issues came up for you all, or if it changed your, the way you look at, uh, at things or. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely want to hear from the actors. Um, but I want to offer something. There was one line that Chris's character said that still resonates with me today. He says, I'm fighting for the black experience. And it was at that point in the play um, where the, the, I felt like the name calling towards the black characters really intensified, right? Why are you so angry? Why are you this? And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, at that point, there were a lot of questions that were being posed and projected towards the, the black characters. And um, I would like, I am the type of artist that I hate surface and superficial conversations. I hate surface and superficial work. You know, I'm, I'm very go hard or go home. And it was at that point in the play when he said, I'm fighting for the black experience that we as a collective were able to kind of go there. Yeah? yeah. Something about that allowed us to fight and really use the work in itself as an opportunity to fight for what we were trying to say. Yes. Um, so I, anyway, I just wanted to put that out there and just hear from the actors as far as, you know, when in the play, like for me, that was that line. That was a turning point right. for me. But where was it for everybody else? That's great. Um, anybody else? I would, I would love to share. I feel like looking back on this play now in the climate that we're in and in my own personal life, how different Lee, I inhabit my blackness is as well as it's just almost surreal. I, I feel like going through the play, watching it now on video and thinking about, um, yeah, like, like you said, like it was, it was a lot of fun. Like the first part of it, there's a lot of like jokes. There's a lot of really good character, like quips um black woman has more of like a role where she's like okay i'm charging us through this and then by the time that we get to the end you know me chris and brian are you know simulating a chain gang and like as as milson has said before like doing these like sprints and like all these kinds of really physical things and we're you know um embodying being those herrero um, at, their, at, at, a, at a low point. And I feel like kind of what you said, Bruce, um, in saying that um, Jake became a heavy, like it, it became th that feeling of oppression, which I think is impressive for the work. It's, it wasn't so much like, I think when I, when I watch it now, I'm like, man, I wish Chris had more lines. Like everything he said was so great. Like I want, I, I want him to speak more. But I, but I wonder if the intent for Jackie was to allow, like, as opposed to having him say the words, I feel oppressed or I'm terrified at like the end, was for, uh, for, to, create the, to create the experience for the audience where you feel the terror and you feel the exhaustion. And you, know, like you, you see the oppression happening to the black actors as opposed to them becoming more and more verbal, them actually becoming less verbal and more phys and more physically playing out the um, the the oppression that they feel. So I think like looking, I mean, I don't know if I would have said, I would have been able to feel like art, like articulate that back then, but when I watch it now, that's that's very much what I feel. Right, it's really interesting. Brian, you have any thoughts? So I did want to say y'all were talking about the physical nature. As an actor, you don't often know what you're going to get into, even though you read something and you see what it's going to be. But I was not in any way um, cardiovascularly in shape to do this. So um, 
it was so much fun and I was so tired at the end. Um, that also, I think, led to what I think the things that we're talking about. I know I was tired. I think we all know we were tired to, to differing degrees. <clears throat> and since we were in a live theater, I think the audience could really see that and experience that with us as much as you can. Um, and I know that was a real big part of it for me because I said, okay, I need to embrace this as opposed to try to fight it off, which is what I would normally do outside of the theater. You know, you kind of, you, you're living the experience and you're saying, yes, this character is experiencing these things because I'm experiencing this as a character. It's kind of that whole relationship. Um, and, it, and it also really made me think of getting to know people, um, kind of what you were alluding to earlier, these people were nice and they were friends at the beginning. And then as they got to know more of each other, then it became more adversarial and became more, you know, I don't agree with you. And why are you saying that? And in the, like you said, the name calling and all that stuff came out and it's like, okay, are you really showing me who you are now? Like, is this some revelation that happened over time or were you always this way? Um, and that was an interesting part of the journey for me uh, was, was really seeing that happen. And, and, also, I, I really got to know Jake a lot, <clears throat> and what he was sharing about his experience through that was really, it was good. I was just like, this is what art does. It changes your perspective on the world that you live in and the people that you come into, count, uh, into contact with, and it, I think it just helps you have a better view of, uh, you know, people's experiences that aren't the same as yours. So when you've had that opportunity to play a character like that, I think that helped him a lot. And be, me watching him experience that helped me a lot. Right. Oh, that's great. Interesting. What about you, Shannon? What about your perspective? Um, so when I, I watched it on Sunday, and I had to, for the first half of it, remind myself, like, Jackie Sibley's jury has written this. I was like, there is so much white centering going on with these white characters the the level of ignorance was really profound for me when I watched that the earnest ignorance which doesn't make it um acceptable and so so I appreciated so much Chris's line when are we gonna see some black people you know in this experience um which I feel like, yeah, I don't, it was just, it was, I just think a reflection of, of white ignorance and, and my own ignorance. I mean, I, when I signed on for the show, you know, I was, I felt nervous because I had to play this woman who like did outrageous things. Um, and, you know, as I've been coming to terms with my own, like, Shannon, what, what have you not been seeing for the, you know, the decades of your life, which my black friends and, and, and members of the community have been burdened under for centuries. And, um, to see that kind of outpictured in the production was really intense and and the inability of the white characters to be able to hear even the words that are just being directly spoken um i mean i you know it, it, from an outside perspective i was like this is outrageous to look at the letters like the letters is like right. <laughs> you know the ultimate like white centering it was very it was very intense um and also to reflect on on how much how much work i i have personally to do um as an individual you know that's the character but also like how much of that is true for myself you know and what is mine to do so that was really right. quite something oh it looks like jake has joined us now and we were just mentioning hi jake hey everybody so we were just Good mentioning yeah, it's good to see you. We were just uh, mentioning that it was hard because as the play intensified every night, I remember you specifically talking about that during the
the rehearsals that it was really hard for you to be that character as the play progressed because you kind of became sort of the heavy in in places and i'm just wondering if if you if that was true for you that it was difficult. well yeah i mean sure uh you know, I don't, I, I'm sh I don't know if Dylan remembers or not, but I think it took me like probably a month to decide whether or not I could actually accept the role. Just because, you know, up till that point, acting for me was all about being liked. Um, you know, uh, you know, it was so important to me that that people liked me. You know, even if I was showing a character doing things that was, you know, just exhibiting the human condition. Um, you know, I, I hadn't realized up till that point that that was so, so very important to me. And this pretty much destroyed that um, <laughs> because there was no way that I could be liked by the end of it. And so, um, yeah, it was disturbing for sure. And um, luckily I, you know, I, I, I was uh, really close with Chris because Chris uh, was who I like screamed at at the, at the end of the, <laughs> at the end of the show. And that was kind of, so luckily he and I like really got close through the whole experience and, and thankfully that was, uh, but you know, I can't imagine how, what he was, you know, going through during that experience. Cause what I was going through is, you know, beside the point what he was going through with with uh uh tapping into that just that blind uh, like rage and and ignorance and and so um so luckily yeah everybody was so amazing and wonderful to work with and so uh you know dylan really created such a such a welcoming such a safe environment for everybody and and yeah um I, I just remember having lots of fun with, with you guys. Um, definitely miss you, miss all of you. And um, it was one of my, one of the best theatrical experiences of my life for sure. That's great. Well, you know that um, the changing worldview, the perspectives that are so different between the, the white actors and the black actors who, the black actors keep wondering okay, but when are we going <laughs> to start exploring the African characters? You know, because they spent, you guys spent so much time about the Germans writing the letters home to their sweethearts and stuff. So what we were just talking about, but that's really, uh, it seems to me, kind of a hallmark of Jackie's work. Um, and her play that won the Pulitzer Fairview, she actually physically, at one point late in the play asks the audience to switch places with the cast. So the audience makes their way onto the stage. The black cast is in the house in an attempt to say, see us from a different perspective. And so, yeah, that's, uh, I think you definitely see that at work here in we're proud to present a presentation uh, as well as Fairview, which is also a very powerful play. Um, um, well, I can't imagine how it would feel to pretty much have every black show be about black issues and not like about life, about family, about, you know, all of these different things, you know, that, that traditional, you know, white plays don't really have any of those sort of funnels that they have to go through. Yeah. You know, and 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 I think over time that'll change, but I mean I, I can't imagine that. I always have to deal with my race and and in every show that I do or every every piece of art that I create, you know. Right. Like why is that the only thing that people want to know about me? Yeah. So I can't imagine that. Well before we open up to more questions from our viewers. I just wonder um, if there's anything else about putting it together 
Millicent or Dylan that you would like to touch on or also it's open to the cast, but. Uh... Um, this is more of a response and reflection to what we've shared tonight. I think that, you know, these kinds of plays where um, you're questioning race, you're questioning sexism, you're questioning all these isms that contribute to systemic oppression, give us an opportunity not just to examine um, uh, one, one side versus the other. Like it's not, you know, I don't, I feel like for me as a creator on this project, I was able to witness white folks wrestling with stuff and black folks wrestling with stuff. And I think anytime that you start to unpack racism and systemic oppression, you have to have, you know, we talk about a universal point of view. Well, the only way that we can have universality is that if all the points of views are arriving to the same place at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So at least for this particular work, I felt like I saw that at the end. So yeah, the focus was on um, Chris and the Herrero. However, what the audience was able to witness was white folks wrestling with trauma as well. You know, the trauma, the self-imposed guilt that comes from dealing with whiteness, dealing with white privilege. Also, like it was really brilliant. And I think that when we have these, these real conversations on racism, it's okay for us to talk about that kind of stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? Like white folks are wrestling with this stuff just as much as we are, you know? It's different, it is not the same. It's exceptionally nuanced and it's exceptionally complicated. But I do think it's important that we say that because what tends to happen is white guilt shows up in the room and then white folks stop talking about what comes up for them. And yeah. we need things to come up for everybody in order for us to dismantle, undo and rebuild and reimagine and, and really get some work done, you yeah. know? Right. So I just wanted to put that out there. Like, um, you know, Jake, you talked about, <laughs> uh, uh, you couldn't imagine yourself playing a role where your character wasn't liked. And, you know, I feel, you know, I, I just graduated from film school. I bumped up against that a lot because the types of stories that I like to tell, the types, types of stories that I gravitate to, it's not always about liking the protagonist. <laughs> It's not like that is not the world I live in. You know, my world is super complex and nuanced. It's complicated, you know, and there are multiple perspectives at play at one time. And that for me is universality. Do you know, it's not through this white lens. It's not through this Western lens at all, <laughs> right. you know? So it was really nice for me to witness your growth in that particular process. And I feel like, you know, having the opportunity to revisit it now, like we're still growing from that particular creative process, right? And, you know, Bruce, you mentioned it earlier. Yes, the piece is timely. It is, it's exceptionally relevant. Why? Because we've taken the cap off of the crap <laughs> and now it's all exposed. It's always been there, <laughs> but now it's exposed and it's given us an opportunity to really go there with each other. That doesn't mean the conversations are gonna be easy at all. And it doesn't mean that they're, we're not gonna experience some discomfort, but it does mean it gives us an opportunity to like really shake some things up, and re-examine so that we can make some really critical decisions about how we wanna move forward. So I just want to put that out there. That's very powerful insight, yeah. Thank you. Um, Dylan, did the, the intensity of the play surprise you as, you all put it together. Um, um, I, I think, I don't know if it surprised me. It certainly surpassed my expectations, I think. Um, I think someone mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm so sorry, I forget who it was, but about the, how at the end of the play, we kind of enter the, maybe it was you, Homo, we enter the horror of sort of oppression collectively. Um, and as I was going back and watching the video, I have to say that, you know, I think the performers did an incredible job and I think the choreography is really helping a lot with that moment at the end. But also the lighting, 
that's happening in, at that moment in the show. I think the virtue of having the underman ceilings there, um, right? And the shot, we were able to get the shadows of y'all's bodies on the ceiling, which was, I think, really powerful. So you really saw the virtue of the underman space where there's not a proscenium or separation at all. Um, I think um, Fairview, you know, Bruce, which you mentioned earlier, which is the show that Jackie won the Pulitzer with, um, ends in this really dramatic moment where Jackie asks all of the um, white people in the audience to go on stage and they go on the set with the white performers and the black cast come out into the house with the black audience or non-white audiences who wish to stay. And, and there's this really dramatic like confrontation. And I think it's, it's quite, um, it is a confrontation, right? Between um, the members of the audience. And I think at Undermain, without the separation, it really felt like, uh, it felt like a place of really significant conflict, not conflict, but contact, right? Which I think is so essential to her work. And I think create space, Millicent, for like the dynamic that you're describing, right? In some ways, this play, certainly when I would see it at the end of the night, you know, it, it, it's sort of almost like a, it, much of it is nuanced. The effect of it is quite, I think, sizable, you know, it's quite dramatic. And I think at the end of the show, it is, it is one of impact and one of breaking open, and maybe removing the cap off. And I think that the performers speak to that, the choreography speaks to that, and I think the, the lighting and, and you know, the set design and the sort of the virtues of the undermain space itself all contribute to that. Right, great. Yeah, so I have a question now from one of our viewers tonight, wanting to know, was this the first production and the answer to that is no, this, and uh, let's see, did it come to other theaters? Yes, I mean, this was, boy, uh, for a couple of years, this was performed at regional theaters all over the country. I know Woolly Mammoth did it. Uh, of course, it was done in Chicago. It was done in California. It was done all over the country. Um, and it, it created quite a splash especially as what was considered Jackie's first professional play. It was really made a great entrance for her and it got people talking. And then uh, another part of that question is, is the genocide more widely known now? I would imagine not really. I mean, the people that, that saw the play all around the country were aware of it, but uh, that genocide is kind of, uh, hidden in all the horrors of the what came to pass in the 20th century, you know, and there you had, I think the Germans were trying out some of their uh, medical practices and things they would later implement again in World War II, but uh, yeah. So I see a lot of people in the chat. Um, I'd like to remind everybody we have a few more minutes and if you have any questions uh for anybody please let us know i wanted to say something if if you don't mind yes sir um i remember when we started this show and in the beginning parts before we started performing and even into the show people were dealing with a lot personally my father died when we were doing this show mm -hmm. and i remember and i was just like and I, I didn't think about that till we were talking about experiencing like you're dealing with stuff. So you had that stuff going on in your life and you have the stuff going on in your character, his trajectory, her, her trajectory in that say in that space. And I just remember that was just such a, I mean, it was such a good thing to have for me personally, but I just remember when that happened to me and we talked about other people's things that they were dealing with, it was just, that was something I, I just remember. And I was like, Oh man, that, that yeah. really, uh, said something to me about that whole experience. And I was fortunate enough a couple of years previous, I did a reading of Diamond Dick, which was about the Tulsa uh, race riots. So when you were talking about what's known, they did the Watchmen, which had a, a link to that as an, e an event, uh, a TV show. And then people were saying, I don't think that really happened. And it was just like, it, it, it happened in 1921. And it's been happening. It's happened since then. But like you said, it just, they right. just get wiped away. People don't talk about it. People don't bring it up. P 
people that lived through it have passed and they didn't tell their families. So it's, it's also that whole cycle of just the miseducation and lack of education on some. Uh, right. Absolutely. So when that, you know, things like that were referred to, I guess at the time as race riots, what they were, they were actually just wholesale, you know, slaughters and murders of, uh, people. So, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying there. Um, um, so, anybody else have any? I have a question to ask for the, yeah. the cast and those people. So, I've been in um, graduate school for the past three years. Um, and I think graduate school is a very like specific experience, yeah. Um, and I think one thing I noticed is how often, I guess what I found is I found it was really hard to be together artistically. I think a lot of people, um, not necessarily in a bad way even, I think people are really growing in awareness of all that they bring into a collaborative relationship, right? Where they're coming from. Um, who they are, and um, I noticed in graduate school, at least, that it was, being together was a real challenge. I think the play uh, anticipates that in a lot of ways, the challenge of being together artistically. And I'm sort of curious to hear, especially from people who haven't been in an academic institution like I have, how does that feel in the real world? You know, how does that been feeling in your spaces in Dallas um, since the show was Yeah, I mean, obviously we're we're going through uh, a lot of the social unrest as the rest of the country is. It really seems like a dawning awareness of well, like what we were talking about with the the white characters in the play have their dawning awareness is brought about by the conflict that they have to create in the play, uh, but. You know, we have had, in, in Dallas anyway, um, uh, we've had protests and we've had some uh, rioting. It's been limited. I think it's been more just civil protest than uh, uh, rioting. Um, but certainly that's, you know, been, I think, on people's minds. Um, I guess, especially in artistic collaboration, right? Like what are the tools I think that people are finding and maybe honing in new ways, you know, to move through conversations like these, which I think are really important to have right now. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like artistic collaboration, like we just, the last play that we were doing that we got shut down during the pandemic was a play by Adrienne Kennedy. Uh, it was her, uh, adaptation of Madame Bovary, and it was a a very diverse cast, and we had some issues to work through, um, because ostensibly the novel Madame Bovary is more to do with gender and class. It's all a, a white European experience, but we sort of bridged that, and everybody just brought their own humanity to it. So we didn't, uh, you know, try to uh, question, you know, why these uh, white French characters were played by a, a diverse cast of people. I mean, increasingly that approach is has been on the rise in the theater. Um, uh, and uh, I think we'll continue to do so. But as far as you other guys and your other projects that you've been on, has it become uh, an increasing issue to work out that type of perspective? 
I think you just have to expect some discomfort when you're dealing with issues of systemic oppression. The nature of racism is ugly. <laughs> and therefore, you got to expect some ugly conversations. Same mm -hmm, thing. Yeah. The nature of sexism is ugly. So you have to okay. expect that. And I think, you know, the real question is, what tools do you have in your back pocket or what things do you have in place to help facilitate moving through the discomfort and onto something that's productive? Um, I always expect it, you know, I, I always. <laughs> but I also come to the table with an absurd amount of grace and love as much as I can. You know, that doesn't mean I'm perfect, but I try to keep that at the front of my mind, knowing that I'm expecting some discomfort, but not, you know, not everyone operates in that way. I've been in some really privileged situations where I've learned from my mentors who were, you know, front line of the civil rights movement, black power movement. They're like, look, only love can put you between a comrade and a bullet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you think about, what that means like people gave up their lives in order for us to have more opportunities as folks of color you know and so um again i'm gonna go back to chris's character's line like i am fighting for the black experience i'm fighting for it because forever it has gone unnoticed it has um you know we have been marginalized and it's not, it's not okay. And, you know, now we're at a point where it's time for white folks to talk about it. It's time for white folks to deal and wrestle with things. It's time for white folks to have conversations with other white folks about whiteness, to learn what whiteness is and how it functions so that we can then do our work. <laughs> right. And yeah. again, like that brings discomfort to folks but you have to expect the discomfort, you know? I also have been pushing back on the, you know, the term riots. Because if we look at, you know, what was happening during apartheid, you know, it, when folks get to a point where they are willing to die for a cause, are willing to die so that the next person can have a better life, that's not their, okay, if you want to call it, maybe they're right, rioting for their lives, but that, those are fighters. They are fighting against systemic oppression. They are fighting against injustice. <laughs> yes. you know? And so we have to be conscious of our language. Most of the protests that I've gone to, they have been exceptionally peaceful. <laughs> I believe there was an article that came out, 93% of the protests that have happened across the country have been exceptionally peaceful. You know, right. so I think we have to learn how to shift, change narratives so that the narrative is really speaking the truth. You know, the narrative is really reflecting what is happening. You know, I wore my Black Lives Matter t-shirt today right. all, right. <laughs> all the time. I am not afraid to speak about it. I am not afraid to bring it into a rehearsal hall. I am not afraid to bring it into a creative process. You know, because I expect discomfort because the nature of what we're dealing with and what we're talking about is ugly. You know, it's like, it's almost as if, as if I had a ball of yarn and inside that yarn was all the ugliness, right? If I'm working to um, undo that yarn, the ugliness is going to reveal itself. I just expect it to be there. And then, you know, allow it to fall out of that ball of yarn so that I can do my work. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, like, it's, it's time, you know, it, it's been time. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. And that's a wonderful, very powerful point. And I do, yeah, we should expect that discomfort. That's part of the process we need to be engaged in. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Dylan. What are you studying? Uh, I was studying directing. Oh, directing in New Orleans. Yeah. In I was in San Diego. Oh, in San Diego. Okay, yeah. excellent. And it was yeah. challenging for the the your cohort to collaborate. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I so yeah. the story. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, I've got, oh, I've got lots. I'm sure you can relate. So I was at UC San Diego, which I think one of the real gifts of the program is it's got directors, actors, writers, designers, choreographers, yeah. academic, right? Uh, like PhDs. And I think everyone is growing in wisdom in their, I think, of the weight that they are carrying into the room and the inheritances that they have, both good and bad inheritances. And I think people are really grappling, especially in a smaller container like graduate school where we live together, right? Like, how do we be together, right? How, um, grad school, I think, had the added challenge of you have like a faculty, right? You have a faculty in administration who has a pretty significant like power uh, dynamic with the students, but I think even as this collective student body, the types of conversations we were having about like, how are we as a community to be together in a way that I think everyone can sense to, then a way that everyone can feel fully alive in, right? Not a place where I feel like I've got to hide part of myself or check some part of myself at the door, right, to blend in, right? Um, I felt those conversations were so alive. It was very exciting and a lot of work and a lot of work, yeah? Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm just curious as to, I think a question I'm asking myself is like how to carry those conversations that we're having on a very, you know, specific container in small rehearsal rooms among people who are peers into, you know, a larger context, right? And it sounds like both of you are speaking that this is the work that is happening across the country right now. Yeah, you always got to question curriculum too. Because if the, the curriculum is going to set you up for those kinds of conversations, if the curriculum is suggesting collaboration, then that'll be easier. If it's not, <laughs> then you're going to find yourself. Well, and, <laughs> and even curriculum that's not inviting collaboration can still create a lot of collaboration. <laughs> True that. <laughs> As I think some people discovered, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a great discussion and it's so good to see all of you. Uh, thank you for being part of it. And uh, if there's anything anybody else wants to add, please jump in. I just uh, know you guys have all committed your time to being with us for a little while. And uh, yeah, carry on the great work and I wish you all health, peace, and prosperity, and uh, just keep on doing it. Thank you, Bruce. Brian, Thanks. I want to cuddle with that, that teddy bear over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to see you all. It, it has really meant a lot, and it's felt better than I thought it would just to see you all. So it, even in this time when we're not seeing people as we normally would, it's so good to see you all. So I, I did want to say that. And I want to say the same thing. It's like super good for my soul to see you all and to see the show. I think that's the very first show I've ever seen myself act in. So, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to see this for the talk back. Um, and so it was kind of like forced to see, you know, um, my work, which I haven't really felt the need to view, you know, or just like it's live and that's what happens. We get to share it. And then seeing it was such a profound experience for me like I thought the pace was awesome you know I was like this pace is rocking <laughs> and like um the the choreography was so fantastic and and Brian like what you said about of course like I was going through so many things at that time too and I felt such a um camaraderie and such deep teamwork and trust and connection with all of you um and I was so grateful to be making work together. So even as the, the work was, even as the content was challenging, the work was eased. You know, it was like kind of like, and this is, you know, like when Bruce and I did Blasted and the work was so horrible, but it was so lovely to be together in, in the challenge, you know, in the things that we were working on together. So I just felt tremendously blessed. And I have to say, like, just seeing everybody, it's like, you guys did such good work. And um, it was really, really beautiful. So I had so many things that came up when I was watching it. And it was tremendous. Here, here. All right. Thanks, everybody. This has been great.
Um, bless you.